I predict Charlie's going to talk about Costco. Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> well, Costco, of course, is a... <laughs> Charlie and I were on a plane recently that was hijacked. With what? It was hijacked. I'm telling about our experience on that hijacked plane when the hijackers picked us out as the two dirty capitalists that they really had to execute. And, but they were, they were a little abashed about it. They didn't really have anything against us. So they said that each of us would be given one request before they shot us. And they turned to Charlie and they said, what would you like as your request. Charlie said, I would like to give once more my speech on the virtues of Costco <laughs> with, <laughs> with illustrations. <laughs> and the hijacker said, well, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. And he, he turned to me and said, and what would you like, Mr. Buffett? And I said, shoot me first. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to be going back in time once again and analysing another one of Nick Sleep's greatest investments, which was his investment in Costco in the early 2000s. I started this little series because I think it's really beneficial to study the best investments from guys like Buffett, Munger and Nick Sleep, so we can learn what they saw in these great businesses. If you haven't seen the first part in the series, which was on Nick's investment in Amazon, then be sure to check that out as well. So that's the topic for today's video and let's get into it. Alright, so the first thing we should look at is Costco's business model, specifically how it's different from traditional retailers, and Nick Sleep probably gives the best explanation in his letters. He says, Costco's retail concept is as follows. Customers pay an annual membership fee of $45, which provides entry to the store for a year. And in exchange, Costco operates an everyday low pricing strategy by marking up 14% on branded goods and 15% on private label, with the end result being that prices are very, very low. So when Costco marks up their merchandise by 14%, this barely covers their operating costs and it leaves the company with basically no profits as shown in the table here. But this is done intentionally to keep prices as low as possible. The winners in this scenario are the customers, who reciprocate by spending around $1,200 a year at Costco. Nick also mentioned that by sticking to a standard 14% markup, savings achieved through purchasing or scale are returned to the customers in the form of lower prices. So if Costco negotiate better deals with suppliers or buy stock in bulk for cheaper, instead of leaving the price of their merchandise as is and raking in the extra profits, they actually stick to their 14% markup strategy and reduce the prices for customers. This invokes even more reciprocation from customers, thus creating the magic flywheel effect of scale economics shared. Nick shares a really good story that illustrates this point about Costco's founder, Jim Senegal, and his commitment to this business model. He says, Costco once bought 2 million designer jeans from an exporter for an all-in price of $22 or so a pair. This was $10 less than Costco had sold the jeans for in the past, offering the potential for a 50% markup and half the cost of other retailers. One buyer recommended taking a higher gross margin than usual, as no one would know. But apparently, Senegal insisted on the standard markup, arguing if I let you do it this time, you will do it again. The contract with the customer of having the lowest prices cannot be broken. So that's a quick introduction to Costco's business model and their founder. And so far, it looks like an incredible business that harnesses the power of scale economy shared. So before we look any deeper at Costco, we need to see if Costco is a high quality business by putting it through my checklist, which looks at the return on capital, the reinvestment rate, and the return on incremental capital. Now when I say my checklist, I just mean the spreadsheet I made. All of these methods are taken from Buffett, Munger, and Nick Sleep. And I'll explain it all in this video if you're interested. Okay, for Costco, I've assumed we're looking at the company in 2004, as that's when Nick was buying big blocks of stock. I know we first bought Costco in 2001, 2002, but I used 2004 so I have a bit more data to work with, because Costco's annual reports only go back as far as 98. Now, before I get into explaining the results, it's important to remember that Costco keep margins low on purpose, which means their free cash flow could easily be much higher. So if we look at the six year period between 98 and 2004, Costco looks like an incredibly high quality business. Costco's return on capital employed back in 2004 was 16%, so right off the bat it was a high return business. Their return on incremental capital was 25%, and the reinvestment rate was 223%, and the runway to continue reinvesting capital at these high rates of return was very, very long. So long, in fact, that 20 years later and they're still going strong. Costco didn't just catch the eye of Nick Sleep either. Charlie Munger also realised how powerful Costco's business was, and said this about the company not long ago. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any footage of Charlie talking about Costco 15 or 20 years ago, 
so this will have to do. But I feel like a lot of the points he makes about Costco today would be relevant back then too. I've always believed that nothing was worth an infinite price. So at some, even an admirable place like Costco could get to a price where you would say that's too high. But I would argue that if I were investing money for some sovereign wealth fund or some pension fund, and a 30, 40, 50 year time horizon, I would buy Costco at the current price. I think it's that strong an enterprise and that admirable a place. I can't bring myself with my habits to pay these big prices, but I never even think about selling a share of Costco just because it's selling at a high price. I'm not worried about, I, I, I'm not saying I'm buying Costco at this price, but I'm certainly not selling any. I think it's gonna be a big, powerful company as long, as far ahead as you can see. And I think it deserves its success. I think it has a, a good culture and a good moral ethos. And so I wish everything else in America is working as well as Costco does. When you hear Charlie talk about Costco, it's pretty clear how much he admires the business, its management team, and the culture they've created under Senegal. And even though Senegal isn't running the business day to day anymore, the culture he created still remains. And this is one of Costco's biggest competitive advantages. Costco's culture has remained the same throughout its entire life cycle. And I think this is one of the biggest factors behind Costco's success, and one of the main reasons why Nick and Charlie invested in the business. When you read Nick's letters or listen to Charlie's interviews, most of the time they spend talking or writing about the business is praising Costco's culture and how it creates an extremely durable moat around the company. Nick wrote that they spend a considerable portion of their waking hours thinking about how company behavior can make the future more predictable and lower the risk of investment. Costco's obsession with sharing scale benefits with customers makes that company's future much more predictable and less risky than the average business. And that is why it's their largest holding. Another good one is when Nick talks about meeting with Jim Senegal. During the conversation, Jim suddenly stopped mid-sentence and disappeared to his filing cabinet. And when he emerged, he had a memo from 1967 written by Saul Price, who was the founder of Fedmar and the man who taught Jim Senegal everything he knew. And Nick actually ended up framing this memo on their office wall because he liked it so much. The memo goes, although we're all interested in margin, it must never be done at the expense of our philosophy. Margin must be obtained by better buying, emphasis on selling the kind of goods we want to sell, operating efficiencies, lower markdowns, and greater turnover. Increasing retail prices and justifying it on the basis that we're still competitive could lead to a rude awakening as it has with so many. Let us concentrate on how cheap we can bring things to people rather than how much traffic it will bear. And when the race is over, Fedmart will be there. And according to Nick, this is the best summary of scale economics share they've come across. Hence why he framed it on the wall. Nick adds that 43 years later, Costco is the most valuable retailer of its type in the world. Cultures that care about the little things all the time are very hard to create. And in the opinion of Jeff Bezos, impossible to create if not put in at the firm's genesis. So even if traditional retailers like, you know, Coles or Woolies, tried to copy Costco's business model, it wouldn't be easy for them to clone Costco's culture. Charlie Munger also had many of the same insights as Nick about Costco. And he talks a lot about Costco's culture. Uh, you said, this is fascinating to me, that you think Costco does more for civilization than the Rockefeller Foundation. Well, I, I do think that a really admirable business that does its job well and creates an honorable culture mm -hmm. where everybody's working hard and trying to deliver huge value to the customers that trust it with all the employees earning above average livings and liking working there and so on. It's a huge achievement. There's a really good article from Masters Invest about Charlie Munger and Costco. And it includes a quote from Charlie where he says, Costco will continue making huge contributions to society. It just has a frantic desire to serve customers a little better every year. When other companies find ways to save money, they turn it into profit, whereas Senegal passes it on to customers. It's almost a religious duty. He's sacrificing short-term profits for long-term success. The author adds that many of the inputs that define Costco's success won't be found in a spreadsheet or formula. Rather, they have to do with the mental models that Charlie always talks about. Things like reciprocation, scarcity, which is also known as availability, culture, incentives, win-win, simplicity, social proof, pricing power, and many more. And according to Charlie, when you have multiple mental models all moving in the same direction, that reinforce and amplify each other, it creates what he calls a Lollapalooza effect. 
I know this sounds a bit qualitative or subjective, but Charlie says that's the point. Investors always want a quantitative factor or a formula when analyzing businesses, and they tend to underestimate things like culture or sharing scale benefits with customers. When Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate, I like the competitive position, I liked the, the way the personnel system worked, I, I liked everything about it and I thought even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. I'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. Charlie also went ahead and answered my next question, which was around valuation. And going off what he said before, he essentially bought Costco for around 12 or 13 times earnings, or around three times book roughly. And for Nick's leap, going off when he really loaded up in 2004, he would have paid roughly 22 times earnings, which isn't that expensive, but it's definitely not cheap either. Although when Nick talks about the price he paid for Costco stock, he believes he got a great deal and essentially bought a quality compounder for a discount to its intrinsic value. So overall, judging by what Nick and Charlie saw back then, I think back in 2004, there was a very high probability that Costco was going to be extremely successful. And I think there's a bunch of lessons we can take from this investment and apply it to our own research. If you watched my last Nick Sleep video about Amazon, then you'll notice a lot of similarities between the Costco investment and the Amazon investment, even though they're very different companies. They're both high return businesses with high reinvestment rates. They both had customer obsessed managers who believe in scale economics shared. They both had extremely long runways to keep compounding. And they were both very predictable because of their business culture. Amazon and Costco look like obvious winners in hindsight. But Nick points out that if we simply look in the right places, then greatness can be known in foresight. So that's Nick's analysis on Costco and I hope you found it useful. If you enjoyed the video, please consider hitting the like button as it really helps the channel grow. And if you watched the video all the way to the end, thank you so much for watching. If you're still bored, I'll put another video up in the corner that I think you'll find interesting. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you guys back in the next one.